Our first speaker is uh, Klaus Walter, kind of setting the day for us, talking about not just the, the drought, but uh, looking ahead and doing a little bit of weather and climate forecasting. Uh, Klaus is the research associate at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He works with the uh, Joint University and NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory. He's become a preeminent uh, speaker as well as researcher in the field for his analysis and prediction of U.S. climate and climate change. He's been involved with the Western Water Assessment and the National Integrated Drought Information System. Many of you, I know many of us, work uh, re reference that on a regular basis. Please join me in welcoming Klaus Walter. Good morning. Uh, I hope you all had your coffee fix, and I'm staring right at the lights now, so... Okay, I have to speak into the mic. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, if I look like a deer in the headlights, it's because of those. Uh, in any case, uh, fasten your seat belts. I usually try to cover a lot of ground, uh, and uh, I'm also supposed to leave some time for questions, so we'll see how this works out. I was asked to do a quick post-mortem on the last 15 years, basically, the drought era we have been in, uh, and then pivot and talk about this so-called Godzilla El Nino, uh, and I will talk mainly about does it really make any difference for us, um, and uh, give you sort of a first hint at, at what I think we can expect. So uh, unless you have been living under a rock, uh, and most of you I don't think have, uh, the last 15 years have been warm and dry. Uh, some of that is probably something that uh, I tend to avoid talking about when I uh, talk to mixed audiences, but uh, <laughs> some of it will be shown to be actually part of natural variability. So it has been warm and dry. Actually, the winters haven't been that warm, uh, on the West Slope in particular, but that doesn't really matter, right? It's the growing season that matters, and that has been quite warm and dry. <clears throat> so one factor that we have been seeing a lot lately, uh, in the last 15 years, we have had what I call double dip La Las Niñas, uh, where, where like 2007, 8, 8, 9, and 2011, 12, 12, 13, were both two-year La Nina events, and we have a history that was confirmed in 11 and 12 of uh, actually having really dry years following the initial La Nina. And this actually gets worse when you have three-year La Nina, like in the 50s, for instance, we had that. Um, so that was one factor. Another one is the much talked about PDO AMO. How many of you have heard about the PDO or AMO? Okay, so it's not quite as infamous or famous as, as the El Nino. Uh, basically, the PDO is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation uh, it is actually a much richer spectrum, so it has variability even on monthly time scales. But in general, there's a tendency for the North Pacific uh, to show the behavior that's shown on the left. When it's cool, uh, it, it tends to be uh, cool along the coast and warm uh, in the central North Pacific. Uh, and I, I don't think I have a, oh yeah, I have a point over it. That, that is actually, I'm not even gonna try. Um, so we have been, in the last 15 years, most of, uh, if you look at the bottom left uh, plot, it has been mostly on the cool side, and that's uh, consistent with the La Nina, which uh, in general is not favorable for us. And on the right side, you see essentially the North Atlantic has been warm really since about 1995. Uh, the biggest impact of that is it tends to favor the Atlantic hurricane season, if you like hurricanes, uh, but it also has a profound influence on our climate. Uh, and this was actually first pointed out by our own uh, Greg McCabe from, from Denver, USGS, uh, who uh, found that if you slice and dice the data and if you look at the, the, negative a, uh, the positive AMO, um, then uh, it tends to be dry around here, uh, especially when you have a combination of a negative PDO and a positive uh, AMO. Now, if these were just decadal switches, uh, you could just say, oh, oh, we, we are stuck in this, but at least we know what's coming down the pike. The problem is the PDO went positive uh, last January, so 20 months ago, and it sometimes does that. So uh, nobody really knows whether this means we have a permanent switch back to positive PDO values or not. But 
if that's the case, that's really our break we're getting right now. The AMO, uh, and you can see that on the right there, uh, the, the, the AMO has been, let's see, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you look at the bottom right plot, it actually has been declining somewhat. So, and, and so the natural cycle of this, if you smooth it, would hint at the AMO maybe lasting another five to 10 years, but it could actually be on its way out. Some people claim that they can predict this and they're saying that this is what's happening. I'm, I'm not convinced about that. Uh, what is really interesting about this is this is one of the first cases I know of where a phenomenon that was found in the data has been confirmed completely independently by running five different general circulation models uh, the Schubert et al. refers to about 27 offers, so I won't name them, name them all. But pretty much everybody was on board in the U.S. And, and looking at this. All of these five models were essentially American models. And uh, so it turns out that the peak of that phenomenon of the PDO being uh, negative and the AMO being positive was reached just a few years ago, in 2012. It was actually, in over 100 years, it was the most extreme combination we've ever seen. So I actually made a forecast uh, in late uh, 2012 based on the left plot where I took the 10 most extreme cases and said that, well, this is, this is what we can probably expect this winter. And you can see the verification on the right side. And uh, it, it's pretty much right on. Um, if you extend this for the whole water year, uh, what screwed up the perfectly good dry forecast in Colorado was, of course, September 2013 which is the reason I wasn't here two years ago. But that's another, so we can talk about it over a beer. Um, so uh, this was interesting because 2012-13 was a neutral ENSO year. So ENSO didn't, you know, El Nino, La Nina didn't help us at all that year. Uh, but the dry forecast really panned out. Okay, so, so those are the two influences that apparently are mostly natural, La Nina and PDO AMO, that have been a big factor for the last 15 years. Um, and now, now we're changing gears. We're looking at the, uh, the so-called uh, Godzilla El Nino. <clears throat> and uh, to me, actually, it looks more like a Peter Falke El Nino. It's a bit rumpled. It's, it seems to be rumbling along. And maybe it will get really big. Uh, if, if you look at what happened last year, if you look at the middle plot, that's the sea surface temperatures. Uh, in 2014, we, um, we actually had that first spike where, where you see the plus one. And people got all excited about this because early in the year on the right side, you see the subsurface ocean heat content. And that was that famous Calvin wave where people said last year, oh, it looks like a super El Nino is coming. And then it kind of fizzled. And, and that's just the state of the art. You have one factor in place, but it doesn't guarantee that it will actually happen. Uh, but the bottom line is we are now running around plus 2 degrees Celsius in the central eastern Pacific. That's something that we've only seen about three times in the last 60 years. Uh, I developed uh, an index that actually keeps track of these various elements. That's called the Multivariate Enso Index. There's a website uh, given at the bottom there. It gets about 4,000 hits a month, so there are quite a few people that actually look at this every month. Uh, and you can see the, uh, at the top right, the value we have now, which is almost two and a half standard deviations, is the biggest since 1998. Uh, and you could argue that by being bigger than anything else except 97, 98, and 82, 83, that is sort of a mini super El Nino. It's like the mini me. Uh, it's, it's still not clear to me whether it's going to grow any further. In fact, 97, 98, uh, you can see on the bottom left, actually peaked around now in the normalized sense. So it might grow further in the sense that the sea surface temperature anomalies tend to get bigger as you go further into the calendar year. But in, in the normalized sense, we may have just about reached what it can do. Uh, the models that we have, there's about 17 coupled models out there. This is the most uh, renowned one. The European model has by far the best skill score in the last 10 years. Uh, and, and it went nuts this year. Uh, and, and it actually is now saying the majority at the bottom right, the, the August uh, forecast plume, there are 50 members, we call them spaghettis. Uh, so those 50 spaghettis, about 35 of them hit plus three Celsius, which would be an all-time record. Uh, 
again, I, I look at this with a jaded, I've been in the business for about 20 years and uh, I, I'm, I'm skeptical. But in any case, it, it is a big one. Uh, and, and one thing I want to point out, this whole term, this talk about Godzilla and El Nino is kind of threatening, right? Um, <laughs> uh, if you look at the net impact on the US economy, it's actually positive. Yeah, you get mudslides in California if you get those rains there, because the Californians will give a lot for those. But for instance, the heating bill, the US heating bill this winter in the Midwest, very likely is going to be lower than normal, because we tend to get warm winters. That alone <laughs> wipes out any, any and uh, we tend to wipe out droughts. Ask the Texans what they thought about uh, this May, uh, because that was also related to the El Nino. So in general, this Godzilla talk, I, I don't like that. It's, 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 it makes it threatening, and it really isn't for most, most of the US. And for others, it may not even matter that much, and we'll get to that. So does the size matter in the Western US? We just submitted a paper, and Andy Hall is the um, lead author on that, where we compared observations of super El Ninos, which are the top uh, it's the, what we call VS, or very strong. Those are the, the two cases that are observed were 97, 98, and 82, 83. And then we look at 16 other cases since 1900 that were still pretty strong, but not quite as strong. And you can see in the observations, of course, the very strong case only has two. So it's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there. But in the observations, there's a clear difference in California if you have a super El Nino, it really makes it much more likely that they will come out of the drought uh, compared to a, a medium strong one. If you look at the models, the models reproduce this. this these are based on 130 different model runs. So it's, it's what we call a multi-model ensemble. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's actually quite encouraging how much it matches over California uh, what the, uh, the impact is of the strength of the El Nino. Now, if you look at Colorado, the differences are pretty small, right? And this is for November through April, I forgot to say. So maybe, maybe for us it doesn't matter that much. Okay. I'm getting, is there a clock somewhere? Am I on time? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm more than halfway through. So if, if you look at the forecast model that, the, uh, that NOAA uses, the coupled forecast system, version two, uh, it has actually had a pretty good track record just in the last couple of years. Uh, I have an extra figure at the end, if, if there's time, that shows that it was too exa irrationally exuberant this summer. It, it, it tried to keep the monsoon going right through August, September, and obviously that's not happening. Uh, but it is predicting a wet fall on the top left, and it has some skill in that area. Uh, and then it predicts a little bit of a hint of a dry winter, uh, unfortunately not supported by skill. The bottom, the gray areas are the ones masked out if the skill is not very good. Uh, and these are the official forecasts. There will be an updated one uh, on the third Thursday of this month. I guess that would be a week from now. Uh, and again, I think this is irrationally exuberant. I think they're leaning too much on that model. Uh, bottom line, uh, temperatures, it's a, it's a you know, crapshoot. It could go either way. But it is uh, leaning towards wet, let's put it this way. And then in the winter, they, are, they have been hesitant to put dryness into Colorado. I, I think it's partially a resolution problem in their model. Uh, and in the spring, it keeps this little wet signal. All right. So if, if you look at more higher resolution data, this is based on PRISM data that basically takes all the observations we have and interpolates it down to about four kilometers, you know, two and a half miles. Uh, so it, it nicely resolves the topography in Colorado, which some of these other models didn't. And if you look at the observations, uh, and this also in incorporates snow tail data, so it actually uses high elevation information. And you can see this little bullseye in the middle there for, for winter season, and it is, unfortunately that means it tends to be dry with an El Nino in the mountains. This is the slide that ski resort officials never want me to show. <laughs> Uh, El Nino does not mean you get a lot of powder in, in Colorado in the winter. But otherwise, green is, is the main color, which means it tends to be wet with El Nino in other seasons. Um, we just updated today, actually, uh, a website where we look at the risk of being in the tails of the distribution. 
Uh, and so there is a, an increased risk with El Nino and there's a decreased risk. So, so where do you get, you know, what are the odds that, that you get a wet year, uh, a wet season, and what are the odds that uh, you won't get a dry season? And, and basically the colors are matching there. And, and so here's the confirmation that in general, in the fall season, uh, El Nino has about a twice the chance of being wet than normal. So, so I think we're still on track, uh, maybe not this month, but in the next two months to, to catch up a bit. And then in the winter, there is this uh, unfortunate uh, preference for white over Western Colorado. And I think the problem here is that this climate division that is used uh, in, in Western Colorado is just too coarse to resolve this. And then in the spring, the green comes back, but it looks much better south of us than uh, in Colorado itself. So I, I broke this down a bit further, and uh, this is a long, this is almost a separate talk, but I analyzed the data and found that you can group the mountains from the Elk Range north into one cluster of, of, of uh, similar behavior uh, in terms of the, the anomalies, and then the San Juan's, uh, the blue uh, dots there, uh, uh, in, in the other region. So if you break this down by season again, and this is for the last hundred years, uh, using this multivariate ANSO index, you can see the green in the fall, um, most of those cases are near normal or wet. Uh, there's, there's really only one, uh, if you go into the top 10%, which is where we're in right now, there's really only one case that was dry uh, in the fall season for, for this region which would include, uh, say, uh, most of the upper Colorado. Uh, in the winter, this is actually, it's very scary. Uh, the top 10 cases, all of them are in the bottom third. So it's, uh, if you want to make a bet, the most likely outcome this winter for December through February in most of the ski resorts in Colorado is, is very dire. It looks like it's going to be a dry midwinter. Okay, so in areas where winter is the main season, for moisture, that's very bad news. In, in areas where you can still catch up in the spring, and the North Central Mountains have a lot of moisture, usually in Mo uh, March and April, uh, this is not quite so bad, the news. But don't let anybody tell you it's going to be dry, uh, it's going to be uh, snowy like heck uh, in the winter because of El Nino, because certainly in the North Central Mountains, that's not the case. And then in the spring, it's all over the place. So very mixed signal there. Now, if you look at the sun once, the story is a bit different. You still have the wet fall signal. And then, uh, except for those two cases in the bottom right, most of the winters have been near normal or wet. So Telluride, you know, pur Purgatory, uh, all those places uh, look at a much better chance of having a wet winter than the northern mountains. And then in the spring, again, is slightly more favorable towards wet. So basically, if you want to have a lot of snow this winter, uh, the San Juan's are uh, the place to go. Is that going to be enough to, to balance out the scale? You tell me. Uh, and we'll actually get to that. I'll show you one slide where I t tell you what I think. Um, how about snowpack? I've reconstructed snowpack back to 1940 based on snow courses and so forth and uh, looked at the one April snowpack. And the one April snowpack kind of is the normal time when people look at this stuff. Uh, and so we have the most data. Uh, upper Colorado in the left and the Yampa and, and so forth uh, on, on, on the right and uh, kind of confirms that dry winter signal. So the winter is important there. But one thing I'm not showing here is for the data we have for the 1st of May, it shows that a lot of the really strong El Nino cases uh, tend to have a boost late in the season. So April uh, tends to actually be quite wet and snowy with an, uh, an Eno. Doesn't mean that all Aprils are, that were wet and snowy are with an Eno, but, but there, is, there is a good shift towards that. 83 is the best example. Another good one is 95, actually. 95, we had a lousy one April snowpack, and, and it just kept going. And in the front range, we peaked in mid-June. <laughs> That's, we should be so lucky. Uh, but in general, uh, so the outlook for one April in the upper uh, Colorado and the Yampa area is, is not so good. Uh, the same is actually true on the bottom right here uh, for the Gunnison. So again, it's from the Gunnison Basin North that uh, we have this kind of outlook. Whereas in uh, the, the San Juan, so the Dolores and, and San Miguel and so forth, uh, we actually have a much better chance of having a near normal or slightly above normal snowpack. 
So what does it mean for lease ferry? So this is the annual flow, natural flow, uh, for the last, what is it, 105 years since 1906, almost 110 years. Uh, and you can see in the bottom and the top right there, that was 1983. 1983 is the best case scenario, right? So, so you get your super El Nino and the spring stays wet enough and you get boosted all the way up there. 98, which was the other super El Nino, is more in the middle pack there. It, it wasn't that, that great. And you can see the, the fourth or fifth biggest one, I think that was 92, uh, ended up being quite dry. So doesn't really mean that much for us, does it? Uh, so what can we do about predicting the natural flow uh, of, of least, uh, you know, at least ferry uh, in addition to ENSO? The two things I always look at in the fall, and some people have seen me talk at the seven states meetings in the last few years. One is there's actually, if you tweak the El Nino and see the variability in the summer uh, between the central and, and, and the eastern Pacific, that can sometimes gives you a good hint which way it goes. It explains 28% of the variance, which is not bad. Unfortunately, this year, the latest numbers are in, and it's more leaning towards dry. It's too bad. The other big one that explains way more than it should, uh, October through December precipitation in the north central mountains of Utah and Colorado. This is the way I grouped the data when I did this 20 years ago. Um, that area gets you know, the, the amount of moisture you get in October through December is maybe 20, 25%, but it explains 42% of the variance total. And you could argue, well, it lubricates the stream channels, so there's maybe some physical effect. I think there's also a tunneling effect. When you have an El Nino, you have this tendency to have a wet fall and a wet spring. So if you come out ahead in the fall, if you don't have a dry fall, if you have an El Nino in a dry fall, you're really in bad shape. But if you have a wet fall, and then maybe luck out in the winter so you don't get into the bottom of the barrel, then that spring, that wet spring signal, which is not very strong, but it might just come through to pull you out. Uh, and, and so there's, but it explains 42% of the variance, which is, which is very good. Obviously, I don't have the data for October through December. My crystal ball for that part of the world and that time of the year is the most cloudy I have. Cloudy meaning murky, <laughs> not, <laughs> not uh, rainy. Um, and uh, right now, the indications I have are leaning slightly negative. I hope I'm wrong. And like I said, I often have been wrong for that region. That's the main, that's the one to watch. So how is the fall panning out uh, uh, this year? All right, there's always one moment of amusement when you go from a Macintosh to a PC, so sorry about some of the mix-ups there. Uh, summary again, the last 15 years, we haven't been doing so well. There's a hint that the PDO is becoming positive. Uh, we have had these false alarm switches to a positive PDO before. I would wait another year, see how this El Nino plays out, before I would make a call that the PDO has become positive, but it would be good for us. Um, El Nino, is very strong, third strongest since 1950. Uh, is it going to get to the same level as a 97, 98? Most of the models are very optimistic about that. It's a bit like predicting the economy for next year. I, I'm, I'm more skeptical. Uh, in any case, it doesn't make that much difference for us. It makes a huge difference for California and Colorado, I think. Uh, it, it only makes a difference in the sense that when you have a really big El Nino, there's a better chance that it will still be around next spring, which is on, on balance is good for us. So I already covered most of that. Uh, the CPC forecasts have been uh, more exuberant than my own or statistical expectations. Uh, and again, that model, I have, I have a verification for that uh, this, spring, this, this summer. When, in June, they made a prediction for July, August, September that's way over too optimistic, so I, I, I don't trust it right now. So bottom line, don't get bamboozled by all this talk about Godzilla El Nino. First of all, it has this connotation that it would be bad for us, and, and in general, uh, the bad thing would be if we had a dry outcome, right? That would be our Godzilla. Uh, but in general, the influence for the Colorado River, the upper Colorado, not the lower, the lower definitely will be wetter. But the upper Colorado is, is uh, very much dependent on how the fall in particular pans out. Uh, I have updated forecasts that I'll make uh, later this month and in November that will be posted at the CWCB website for the draw task force or the 
water availability task force. Uh, I still don't know what the time is, but I hope I left some time for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Surely. It's very hard to see anybody. Yeah. Um, well, you talked a lot about Colorado. Pat and I are going to talk about California. We talked a lot about Colorado, but we're going to talk about California in the next couple of talks. And so I've been thinking. Yeah, all oh, the blob. Can you explain that to people? Yes. Um, <laughs> Go to repeat so, the question. Yeah, the question was about the so-called blob. Uh, uh, and and uh, I did not show, I guess I did not show a picture of the sea surface temperature anomalies that we have right now. So, so uh, what we have along the equator is the classic El Nino. You know, it's, there's no flavor anymore. Right now, it's just a very strong El Nino, not quite super, I guess. Uh, but then to the north, off the coast of Western North America, so in the Eastern Pacific, we have these so-called blobs of warm sea surface temperature anomalies, and they have been moving around a bit. Um, I'm not an oceanographer, but I took courses in it, so what I understand is that the mixed layer, basically the area where you have these anomalies from the surface down, is very shallow in the summer. So the amount of energy it takes to change that, if you get a lot of storms going over there, it, will, it would disappear very quickly. So I, I don't think in terms of predictive value, in terms of saying what's going to happen this winter, uh, I, I don't think there's any reputable scientist saying that all oh, this blob is going to stay in place. Beware of those that do say that. Um, so um, I think it's a total crapshoot. If, if, if the blob stays around, yes, it could negatively impact uh, the, the, the state of California in particular, just like it did last year. We had a similar thing last year. If you look at the exact location of these things, they do move around, and details like that matter. Uh, but if we get that super El Nino, basically if you look at the model runs that I mentioned, the 130 different ensemble members, if you look at the aggregate difference between uh, a normal to strong El Nino and a super El Nino, the jet stream along in the subtropics gets much stronger with a super El Nino. And that means you can undercut that ridge that will try to build off the coast. Um, but one thing I will say is that if you look at the so-called flavor of El Nino we have in terms of this, this blob, I am not aware of any significant El Nino event in history that had to contend, you know, if that thing were to stay in place, that would be a new thing. So it really, we wouldn't be basing anything we say about this on data. We don't really know what that does. But like I said, I think it's not that hard to remove it if we get those storms going. And mind you, and this is sort of flipping my head to the flood task force in California, and I talk to them all the time. I, I, I've been, I'm, I'm under contract with Jeanine Jones uh, for the Department of Water Resources there. Uh, the atmospheric river events, the, so the flip side of this, uh, is that if you have that extra warm SST off the coast and you have one of those streams of moisture coming into California, all else being equal, having higher temperatures means that you get more moisture into the air. And it's exponential. So the warmer it is, the, the more pronounced the effect is. So there is a real concern, actually, that we would flip not just from drought to wet, but from drought to flooding especially in areas that had fires and all that. That's the short answer. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Klaus. <laughs> <laughs>